Hi friends, thank you for joining us today. I want to mostly just chat with you today and share some thoughts, some things that have been on my heart, on my mind, and I want to share with you. The Bible is full of the concept of blessing. God blessing us, our blessing one another, and the study of of blessings could be a long, comprehensive study. But some observations I've made and some conversations I've had just recently have made me want to just lift some of the cream off of that blessing study, what we could do. And, and let's see what we can get today that we can apply immediately because our world, our communities, our lives are in such desperate need of blessing and knowing how to give a blessing. Certainly the Lord has blessed us. And as he blesses us, he also commands us to bless one another. Now that's just one of those things that's kind of sitting on the shelf and we kind of know that and we do little things and, and think that that's all right. But, but there's some very specific things, some very necessary things about giving a blessing that we need in our society, we need in our community, we need in our churches. So the source of all blessing is God himself. He is the source of all blessing. The blessing of God is never merited by us. He doesn't give us blessings because we deserve it. He gives us blessings because he is a gracious God who wants to give blessings. Our blessings are not just for our benefit, but he gives us blessings so that we might bless others. So let's just first of all say we are blessed to bless. He blesses us and then we bless. So God's blessings initiate this chain reaction of blessings. So the one who is blessed becomes a channel of blessing to other people. Ultimately, the blessing returns to God who gave it. And when we thank him and praise him and give him the credit he deserves, which is glorifying him, then the circle of blessing is complete. So the circle is that God blesses me, I bless another person, that other person blesses God because he is the ultimate giver of the blessing, the giver of the gift. So there is vertical blessing, and then there is lateral or horizontal blessing. Our relationship with God as his children, as believers, in New Testament as born again believers, empowers us to bless other people in God's name, on his behalf. It's kind of like signing his name to a check. And so we have to be careful that we use that correctly, that we use it um, with holy attitudes, with right intentions that truly reveal the mind and heart of God. But the first thing we need to do is think about blessing God, blessing God. We've said that God is the one from whom all blessings flow. We sing the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And so how in the world knowing who God is and knowing that he is the giver of all blessings, how in the world are we going to bless him? How can me, little old me, how can I bless God? Blessing God is one of the strongest and most meaningful ways to worship and to praise God. It is the very purpose for which we were created. God created us to praise him, to worship him, to have that kind of relationship with him, that personal relationship with him that bows before him, that receives from him, that gives to others and then gives all the praise and the glory back to him. So the God who blesses with every blessing is himself blessed by praise. Praise is like applauding him. It's like identifying what he's done. It's thanking him for it. Now. The word blessing means good word, good word. Now we can say good words to God and about God all throughout the day. 
Maybe things come to your mind all the time. It's a mindset that focuses on God and his goodness and his power to do good. So we develop this God consciousness. That's an important trait, a God consciousness that makes any moment a sacred moment because when I am conscious of him, of who he is and of his presence with me and in me, then in every little thing, I can just say, thank you. Praise God, bless God. There is nothing in life that is not an opportunity to praise God to applaud him, to bow before him, because we know he is good. We know he is perfect. We know he is true and honest. We know that he is a good provider. Job, in the midst of all of the tragedies of his life, when he had lost all of his family and he had lost all of his wealth, said this, Job 121, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Psalm 34, one says, the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, bless is synonymous with the word praise or a song of praise. And so what the psalmist says is, you know what? I'm gonna be singing songs of praise in my heart, in my mind, and even with my mouth all throughout the day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So sometimes we say thank you in obedience, even when we're not to the place of feeling thankful. Just thanking him because he said so. Not in a smart aleck way, but thank you. Help me to see this from your perspective. Help me to get this. Philippians chapter four, verse four says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then you know, verse six of Philippians chapter four, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what's the promise? And the peace of God which passes all understanding, will keep your minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. We're living in times when we need our minds kept, don't we? Kept straight, kept focus. So continuous praise and thanksgiving nurtures a God consciousness in our hearts. And that is the foundation for kneeling in reverence before him or blessing him praising him, thanking him. God conscious people are going to think of God first. They're going to try to see things from God's perspective. And then we're going to ask him to help us see it the way he sees it so that we'll respond to it the way he wants us to respond. So a God centered life, a God focused life, a God conscious life is going to be a life of blessing, of receiving blessing and giving blessing. Because once we have that God consciousness, then we're going to be aware of other people. There's an awareness of others that comes with God consciousness. Um, our Jewish friends teach us that before anything else, one must first bless God. The Bible is full of it especially the Old Testament. Psalm 103 verse one says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Goodness, we could read the whole Psalm, but then the Psalmist goes on to list his attributes, to list his benefits. Forget none of his benefits. What does he say? He pardons all of your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with loving kindness. That is a beautiful Hebrew word. It's the word hesed. We might ought to look at that one day, but he crowns you with hesed, loving kindness and compassion. He satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And then he goes on and on. The Lord performs righteous deeds. And so what's he doing? He's blessing God. He is recalling to God his gratitude, but he's recalling to God what he knows about who he is. And God is blessed in that. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And then down in verse 22 of that same Psalm, 
He says, bless the Lord, all you works of his in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. So he's into it. He's blessing the Lord. He's calling out the things that he is, that he does. He's bowing before him. He is applauding him. Then in Psalm 104, verse one, he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with splendor and majesty. So those are the kinds of things that you can say to God. If you don't know what to say to bless him, get you a scripture verse that blesses him and just use that. Praying scripture back to God is an incredible thing to do. And God honors that. Then Psalm 134, 134, Verse two says, lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Sometimes you just don't know what to say, but you just are aware of who he is, of his goodness, and you bow before him. Psalm 119, verse 164, David said, seven times a day, I praise you for your right judgments. So what do we see here? We see a God consciousness. We see an awareness of who God is, of what his attributes are, of what he does for us. And we praise him. We thank him. So realize that this is not only rich Hebrew heritage. It was foundational to the faith of Jesus and the apostles. That's the way they thought. That's the way they lived. And so they blessed the Lord at all times and they gave thanks in all things. So God himself is the source of all blessing. So we can bless God really only in the sense of praising him or glorifying him and obeying him. Because when we obey him, we acknowledge that we know he knows more than we do and that he's up to something that we can't do by ourselves. So we bless God, bless God first in all things. But when God blesses us, we are to bless others. We're to bless others. Well, what about blessing others? Let's talk for a minute about the power of spoken words. The power of spoken words. Words probably have far more power than we have ever stopped to think about or to imagine. Words can be creative or they can be destructive. Words can build up or words can tear down. Proverbs 11, 11 says, through the blessing of the upright, through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. By the mouth of the wicked is destroyed. Now, if spoken words can exalt or destroy a city, they certainly can have an impact on an individual, on another person. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25 says, Anxiety in the heart of a man weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. What can we do with people who are depressed? Give them a good word. Help them think good words. Proverbs 16, verse 24 says, pleasant words are as honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Wow, good words, pleasant words. In Proverbs 18, 21, there's a striking statement. Think about this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So our l words have lasting impact, both for doing harm and for doing good. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter four and verse 29, let no unwholesome word. Now that word unwholesome could be translated corrupt or foul or rotten. So let's just say that. Let no corrupt, foul, rotten, unwholesome word come out of your mouth, proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. So there are good words and bad words. Um, there are benediction, and that word means good word, 
and there are bad words, maledictions. Benedictions and maledictions, but let me give you another word for that. Good words are blessings. Bad words are curses. So we've got good words, bad words, blessings and curses. A blessing is a good word. A curse would be words that are uttered with the intention of bringing about destruction. I hope you fall off a cliff or, you know, wor words that tear down, that are destructive. A curse is cruel, unkind, harsh words, bitter words. They're like judgment without mercy. God is not a God that is absent mercy. We're not to be absent mercy as God's children. So, you know, you've heard these curses. Now, mind you, we usually think of curses as being what we think of in our language as curse words. Not necessarily, not necessarily. A curse is any negative thing, any, anything that comes about, and, and you've all heard them. What about, um, you'll never amount to anything. Or what about, you are just like somebody bad. Or what about this one? Why can't you do as well as your brother? Or why can't you do as well as your sister? Or why can't you do as, why can't you do, be like the neighbor's kid? So sometimes we say mean things about unchangeable features. Isn't that the ugliest nose you ever saw? Look at those ears. And those things, those words are curses. Now parents, give curses to their children and don't even realize it. Don't do it on purpose, just comes out of their mouth. And so we're living in a noisy world that is filled with sounds of verbal put downs and insults and disrespectful, trashy talk. It's all around us. Some of these curses, we read about them, we hear about them. Some people are even trying to put deliberate curses on groups of people. Well, I've got some good and powerful news, and I want you to hear this. Get this. Blessings overcome curses. Blessings overcome curses. Blessing cancels the curse, and when the blessing cancels the curse, God takes up the vengeance. It's kind of like um, if you were bitten by a snake, a poisonous snake, you would need to get some kind of medicine that would neutralize that poison so that it would be canceled, it would go out. Well, a blessing neutralizes the poison of a curse. And so we don't want to get in the mess of somebody giving us a pronouncing a curse on us and us giving them one back. I hope you fall off a cliff. Well, I hope you fall off one first. Uh-uh. That's a curse feeding a curse. What we want to do with a curse is answer with a blessing because that is the antidote for the curse. It equalizes it. So we are not to respond to a curse with a curse. So how do I do that? How do I give a blessing? Well, doctors John Trent and Gary Smalley have written some really good books on this subject. One is called The Blessing. <clears throat> and in giving a blessing, we're giving a gift of grace, a gift of unconditional love and acceptance. And so doctors Trent and Smalley have concluded that the giving of a blessing as described in scripture always included five elements, five elements. The first one is meaningful and appropriate touch meaningful and appropriate touch. The second one is a spoken word, a spoken message or a spoken word. We've already talked about the power of spoken words. That's the biggie, that's the best way to give a blessing. The third thing is attaching high value to the one being blessed. Attaching high value to the one being blessed. Number four, picturing a special feature for him or her. And number five, there's an active commitment to fulfill the blessing, to fulfill the blessing. Now, if you want to look at those in detail, you might get their book, <clears throat> The Blessing. But for now, 
I just want you to think about some things with me. I just, we just need to chat and take some of this cream off the top. How a person views and talks to children and young people and adults for that matter has a significant effect on how that person thinks and acts. How a person views and talks to another person, especially children, has a great effect on how that person thinks and acts. Deep within every heart is the longing for approval. Every person hungers, thirsts for approval and affirmation. We need to know that we are loved and valued. We need to have that confidence that there is a place where we belong, where we are okay, where we are received. Maybe again, not because we deserve it, but we're living in grace and we're going to give it even when it's not deserved, even as God gives us blessings that we don't merit. Now, if a child does not get that from a parent or maybe a grandparent, he or she is going to look for it somewhere, some way. They're desperate for it. They're going to do whatever they need to get it. Now, we all need words of affirmation about our personhood. I don't have any children of my own, but I spent a good many years working as a speech language pathologist in a couple of clinics and in public schools. And so many times I have seen children applauded and affirmed only when they're performing well, only if they do a good job. And it became my conviction that sometimes a child just needs a hug or an applause when he's not doing anything. I've said to parents, sometime when you just see your child sitting in the floor doing nothing, watching TV, reading a book, just hug him and say, I am so glad you are mine. I love you. So we affirm them for their personhood, not just by their performance. And that goes a long way. It gets a child's attention. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus blessed children who were sitting on his lap. Meaningful touch. Get close to them. Sit close to them on the sofa. They may act like they don't like it at first, but you know what? They really do. They really do. And so Jesus held these children, and there's a nurturing and a healing and an affirmation in meaningful touch. You know, for us, it can be a handshake. It can be a pat on the shoulder. I know there are going to be some people are going to say, oh, we're, you know, these days of pandemic, we can't shake anybody's hands. We can't touch them. You know what? If somebody needs a handshake, I shake their hand and then I pull out my hand sanitizer. It works. And so we've got to be willing to know that that person is included. We can't send that message that we're holding people at a distance. Now, we've already talked about the power of spoken words. Um, they can be words of affection. I love you. I love you. Uh, they can be words of reconciliation. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? They can be words of vision and promise. When you look at somebody, especially a young person, and say, you're going to do something great one day. I look forward to seeing what you're going to do because of what I see in you. Vision, promise. You are going to make a difference in this world. Or maybe they're just words of security. Don't we all need that? You will always be mine. I'm so grateful. And it was years before I didn't, I knew that everybody didn't have this, but you know, certainly my parents were like other parents. They didn't do everything right. But one thing I always knew, and one thing they always told me was that I could always come home. My daddy would say, don't forget your raising. But if I messed up or whatever circumstance I found myself in, I knew that my mom or my dad, they'd come get me. 
they'd come get me and bring me home. I had that place and they were always good to tell me that they loved me. All kids don't grow up like that. I know that now. I have adult friends who have shared with me, my parents never told me that they loved me. I knew they did, but they never said that spoken blessing, that power of the spoken word. You know, we've got to do a better job of communicating to other, you matter, you matter to me. I value you. I see good things in you. I'm so grateful that you are a part of my life. You know, <clears throat> I've read some research about some of this stuff. And one of the things that I read is that some people have lined up prisoners, both adult prisoners and um, prisoners in, that, that were younger in youth detention centers, and they would line them up and say, did anybody ever say these things to you? Did anybody ever tell you that they loved you or that you were going to do something good? And everyone said, no, no. You know, if you spend all of your time telling a child or young person that they're bad, then they're going to think that that's their identity and guess how they're going to behave? bad. That's what they think they're supposed to do. And so what have you done? You have pronounced a curse that has got to be answered, that has got to be uh, neutralized with a blessing. When we see potential in somebody, we've got to be willing to speak words of value, words that point toward a future that is connected to God. God has a purpose for your life. God is going to use you. God can use you greatly. I can't wait to see how God is going to use you. I can't wait to see what God's career calling is going to be on your life. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Are you listening closely? Children are not the only ones who need this. Children need it. So do young people. Adolescents, teenagers, young adults, middle-aged adults, senior adults. Rich people need it. Homeless people need it. Everybody needs it. The world is full of adults walking around with scars and bad memories from childhood. I'm old enough to have talked to a lot of them. You know, maybe a teacher, do you ever see this? Maybe there was a day when a teacher held up your paper to the class as if it was muddy, had dirt on it. And they roll their eyes and said to the class, look at this, before they handed it back to you in front of everybody. Maybe your parents, maybe your parents never said, I love you. Past hurts can program future behaviors in us. Past hurts become a stimulus for future behaviors. And sometimes these curses, these bad words produce in us sore spots, sensitive places, tension buttons. And if somebody accidentally hits one, we go off. Without a blessing, especially a parent's blessing, one can live angry and driven and detached and empty. The world is full of adults who are walking around still longing for a blessing. When a blessing is absent, people tend to search for it in other places. We're hungry for it. It's like food that we have to have to survive. 
And so some people, when they don't get this, they, they work harder and harder and harder, and they're driven, and they conclude that no matter what they do, nothing is ever enough. Or they may search for acceptance in other places. Sexual promiscuity, gangs, cults, rioting in the street, tearing down buildings. They may withdraw into loneliness or anger. They may attack others just to be noticed, to be heard. Or sometimes people just live with the hurt, live with the longing, never feeling fulfilled and satisfied. In the beginning, I, I told you that I've had some recent conversations and observations that put this lesson on my heart. One was a conversation about a fine young man. He has a sweet wife, a good job. They are a godly, loving couple. And all the young man wanted was for his dad to come see their house, to see the home that they were making, and just spend some time with him. Just come, Dad, and, and be in my home and, and let me love you. The invitation was given and a time was planned, but when the time came, once again, the dad had something else to do and he didn't go. His adult son just sat down and cried like a baby. What do you do <clears throat> when you've never received a blessing? How do you get over it? Well, you would think that many believers who have had these struggles would find a blessing in a church family, in a, in a, maybe in a life group or something. But, you know, I've heard and experienced lots of stories for lots of years, and I'm going to tell you a fictitious story, but it is a conglomerate of true stories, okay? So let's think about a guy, and let's just call him Guy. The most encouraging place of fellowship that Guy knew was the bowling alley with his Wednesday night bowling league. He lived for Wednesday nights and all those guys would eat together and fellowship together and slap each other on the back and they would applaud when each other made a strike. And there was this closeness and camaraderie of being on a team. He had a hard home life and he had a hard job and he really looked forward to Wednesday nights. So going to the bowling alley was a good place to get away, to be affirmed, to be valued. But after bowling, he still had to go back home and go back to work. He met a guy named Ed who was a committed Christian. Guy envied Ed's personal life. He saw him as a man of peace and joy. He saw the blessings in his life. And over several months, he just watched Ed live this positive Christian life. And Guy was thirsty. He wanted that. And so Ed started meeting with Guy regularly and he taught him about his need for a savior and the new life he could have in Christ Jesus. Well, Guy gave his life to Christ and he was saved. Well, Guy and his wife began attending church and it was a fairly large church near their home. It was a Bible believing, Bible teaching church, had a good reputation, but they never seemed to feel accepted and comfortable. The pastor was an excellent communicator. That wasn't a problem. But Guy was confused by a lack of 
warmth and personal relationships when the preaching was over. So they started attending Sunday school to develop some deeper friendships. But after several months, no change. Well, Ed took another job and moved away. And God just ached over the lack of Christian fellowship, personal relationship with other Christian men. He hungered for it. So he'd given up his Wednesday night bowling to go to church on Wednesday nights. And even when he initiated a conversation with somebody at church, it was, hi, how are you doing? And it just became awkward because then nobody seemed to know what to say after that. Nothing to talk about. Strained and uncomfortable. Guy gave up. There were pockets of friendly people in the church, but they were friendly always to each other. Same people, week after week. Set in the same place with the same people, not noticing who else was there. And after a while, Guy went back to the bowling alley. Maybe some would say he should have been more mature. He should have just kept on and just concentrated on giving to others. Maybe he should have just held on. He just should have been mature enough to do that. But he wasn't. And there are many people just like him. We may not like to admit it, but many people find more elements of blessing in a bowling alley or a gym or a bar than they find in church. Jesus was the master of blessing. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Peter says he went about doing good. He brought blessing on earth in everything he did, in everything he said. It was always good. It was always helpful. It was always edifying. And he was verbally blessing others right up until the time just right up until his last minute on earth and his ascension back into heaven in Luke chapter 24 says he lifted up his hands and blessed them as he was leaving. It was his lifestyle. It was who he was and what he did. And, and after he blessed them after his ascension, the Bible says that they who were there went back to the temple praising God. God is the one from whom all blessings flow. Jesus had passed on the blessing, and so what are they doing? They're blessing God. The circle completes itself. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 speaks strongly to my heart. It says, you, you believers, and a church is not a building. A church is a group of people who are believers. They hold the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in common. You, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You. We are a spiritual race. Um, it's not a race in the sense of ethnicity or skin color or country of origin. We hold the Holy Spirit in common. We are a spiritual race. We share one spiritual father and he has called us out and set us apart from everybody else on earth. Believers are different from and empowered in a different way from everybody else on earth. And we have direct access to God. 
We don't need another mediator. The only mediator we need is Jesus. And he has died to make that way open to God for us. And we can go to God anytime because of Jesus. He made us. He put us here. That's what this verse says. You are a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim his excellencies. That's blessing God. That's blessing God. When we tell him back or when we tell others about all of his excellencies, then we're declaring his praises and we're blessing him. Christians are not better than anybody else, but we're blessed. We're blessed. And that privilege of being blessed brings the responsibility of blessing others. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, never forget this. Write this down. A blessing is more powerful than a curse. Now, sometimes our emotions get tangled up and ooh, we want to get back with it. But if we want to fix it, if we want to neutralize it, then we're going to give a blessing. We're going to give a blessing. Now, a curse means to consider someone or something as if they didn't have any value. They, they weren't worth anything. So I guess what came to me when I was studying some of this is we can give a curse by not saying anything, by just ignoring somebody. Because what message have we sent? We've sent them a message, you don't matter. You don't matter. So when we brush somebody aside or ignore somebody, we've sent a message. I want to tell you something. I've become so aware of it through the years. How many messages of rejection we send not sitting down thinking, well, I'm going to send a message of rejection to you. It just happens. And you know where it happens? It happens in churches. Jesus is not like that. That's not what he does. And so it becomes even the unspoken behavior becomes a malediction instead of a benediction. And in the Old Testament, the only thing that was more powerful than a curse was a blessing. So we've got to be about the business of neutralizing that. Because we're God's people, we're the only ones that can do that. We're the only ones who can do that. Blessings are acts of faith. They're acts of faith. It is by faith that we obey the command to bless our enemies. You know, you think, bless your enemies? How dumb is that? How are you going to bless an enemy? Do what? But I'm going to bless my enemy because that is going to neutralize the poison. And it frees God up to take up the vengeance. How am I going to do this? And, and, and I know all the reasons. I know, oh, Sharon, you know, I'm shy. I can't think of what to say. I don't, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to say this. I'm going to tell you where you're going to start. You're going to ask the Lord to show you how. I know what it is to be shy. Most of you that know me wouldn't believe this, but I was a very shy young person. I just thought I ought not speak to anybody that didn't speak to me first. My mother used to say to me, it's okay for you to do it first. No, not in my mind it wasn't. We've got to take that initiative. It is a decision we're going to make. Now, blessing can't just be in our mind and our heart. It has got to be bestowed. You've got to do something, to say something, to respond, to bless. So ask the Lord to show you how and when to give a blessing. Ask him for wisdom and insight and discernment and understanding of how to bless someone. Ask him to show you what their needs are. If it's a person that's afraid, then you're going to may say something like, I'm going to pray that the Lord will bless you with his peace because there is no fear in God. There are all kinds of things you can find scriptures to bless with. And sometimes 
I've made a list of them. Just sit down and go through scripture and find ways that we can speak blessings, scriptural blessings. So, you know, we've talked about the high value of spoken blessings and sometimes we can't do that. Just sometimes we just can't. And when we can't, what else can we do? Well, there are a lot of little things I think we can do. How do you feel when someone rushes up to the grocery store door and opens it for you? Like, ah, yes, that's a blessing. So you can open the door for somebody. I don't have a problem with opening the door for a man. Maybe he's got his hands full, his hands full of groceries, a child, whatever. Open the door. Maybe you could let someone in line in front of you. You've been in that place in the grocery store where somebody in front of you've got a grocery cart this full and you've got three things and they let you go ahead. Let, they let you go before them. That's a blessing. It's kindness. You know, speak to somebody you don't know. Bless them. You look nice today. I hope things go well for you today. Think of ways you can include people who are not usually included. Say thank you. Sing cards. Make phone calls. Write notes. Be kind. Be polite. Be compassionate. Be on the lookout for thirsty people. People needing that touch. And where's it coming from? It's coming from God through you. And it goes back to him. And it frees him up through you as a channel of blessing to do something good in that person's life. Sometimes maybe you just need to sit down and listen to somebody. Just talk to them. I've seen this so true among the elderly. They need hugs. They need somebody to just take their hand. They need somebody to speak kind words to them. I talked yesterday on the phone. My mother's cousin called me. He'll be 91 in a couple of days. And he said, I don't know why I'm still here. He's sitting in an assisted living home. And I said, Bob, God's not through with you yet. God uses us in ways that we don't know he's using us. Let me finish this because I want to talk to you believers for a minute. There are some things we need to do at church. We need to smile at people. We need to acknowledge, let them know that we know they are there. We need to say hello. Maybe we need to sit with somebody who's sitting alone. Maybe, maybe you need to just ask somebody, how can I pray for you? This happened to me with a lady in our class. She's probably going to watch this. But some, some weeks back, she was new to our church. But she ran into me in the church parking lot and said, how can I pray for you this week? Well, I could give her a list. And we've had many conversations since then. But it's okay. It works. Just do it. I was having a conversation with a close friend just the last few days, and she said, you know, I so appreciate it when Vicki speaks to me at church. And I looked at her, and she said, she doesn't really know me, but every time she sees me, she speaks to me and calls my name. today. Would you ask the Lord to show you somebody who's thirsty? If you see a curse taking place, pray a, pray a blessing over that. If you see people on TV rioting, Lord, bless them with a knowledge of yourself. Bless them with your peace. Bless them by letting them know that you value them. Listen, God values you. And God is willing to look at you eyeball to eyeball, eye to eye, eye contact. 
and touch you with a meaningful touch and speak a good word and send you out to bless others and all of us together will praise God and bless Him. That will go a long way to changing our world. When we start doing the things that God has told us to do and being the kind of people that Jesus was, we're going to see a change and we'll see a move of God. Go bless somebody today. And God bless you. Amen.